Hi, Gary Stearman coming to you from Prophecy Watchers, and I want to tell you that October 10th through 13th is coming soon, right Bob? Absolutely. Watchers Weekend coming to Norman, Oklahoma. 14 speakers, some of the leading Bible prophecy experts in the entire world. L.A. Marzulli, Bill Salas, Bill Koenig, Mark Hitchcock, the list goes on and on. And Bob, there's something special about this conference. It's not quite as big as the ones we've done in the past, and we are running out of room. We only have room for 600 people. There's something else special. We're going to have a special building dedication of our new building this year. We're also going to have the premiere of Brent Miller Jr.'s new film, Before the Wrath, aired for the first time ever at our event. Bob, I can't wait to see that film. It's going to be fantastic. Of course, our speakers will be covering current events. So we're going to have speakers talking about the blessed hope. It's going to be great. Just register at prophecywatchers.com, and we'll see you there October 10th through 13th. Today, we're going to talk about our favorite subject, the rapture of the church. And here to talk about the rapture of the church is Dr. Thomas Ice, who has written more than probably you have even read about the rapture of the church. And uh, we call him Tommy around here. Tommy, welcome back to Prophecy Well, Watchers. thank you. I've never grown up, as you know. <laughs> and, well, that's a good thing. Yes. Got to keep your youth. We have uh, an article in uh, this edition of the Prophecy Watcher the September edition, 2019, and in this magazine, uh, Tommy has written a history, and he is a historian without peer. When it comes to church history, he can take you back in ways you can't even imagine. But there's something fascinating that you wrote about the rapture of the church, and I'm just going to turn you loose and let you talk about it. Well, I remember 30 years ago, or so when I started working with Tim LaHaye at the Preacher of Research Center. And having a master's degree in historical theology, it was called, uh, I knew that no one before Darby ever taught a preacher of rapture. At least that was the belief. And Tim LaHaye was adamant. He used to say, surely there's somebody out there before Darby that taught that. And so I began, uh, and in the first year... Grant Jeffrey called me on the phone one day, and we were in Washington, D.C., and I remember eighth floor of my office looking out at the Washington Monument, and uh, he said he'd found a ancient preacher rapture statement, and he read it to me, and I said, well, that sure sounds pre-trib, and uh, I said, you know, I just don't believe you, though, because I've been taught, you know, <laughs> there's no one before Darby, you see. And so uh, I called Dr. Ryrie up, one of my professors at Dallas Seminary, and read him that without telling him when it was from. And he said, well, that's pre-trib. And I said, yes, it is, but they're claiming it's from the 300s. <laughs> and so uh, being, living in Washington, I went to the library there at Catholic U that had the largest patristics or early church uh, library in the United States. And I found that sermon and I paid somebody to translate it out of Latin because there are over 500 volumes of church fathers all the way up to about the Reformation that have never been translated into English. And uh, wow. so there's a lot of stuff out there <laughs> that many of us don't know about. And uh, so we studied it out and sure enough it was a pre-trib rapture statement back in the 380s coming from north from uh, Egypt. And so began uh, the finding after that of many more. In fact, I went through uh, in this article, the two, two uh, segments of it, I cite 35 pre-Darby, pre-trib rapture statements uh, that we have found thus far. And that's primarily only in English, although some are not. Now, it's important to know this because a lot of people are going around saying John Nelson Darby invented the, pre right. the concept of the pre-trib rapture. 
and therefore it's less valid. Uh, it, it's the creation of one man, and there, we don't necessarily have to believe in it. So take it from there. Well, and in fact, uh, that is probably the number one question I get over the years is how come nobody believed in the preacher of rapture before 1830? And uh, why, and then I guess you could say, why are we finding all of these all of a sudden? Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we're finding these all of a sudden is obviously the scholars in the past weren't interested in finding preacher of rapture statements. (laughs) And uh, it just so happened in the last 15 years uh, for example, the British Library, which has everything that's ever been printed in Great Britain, uh, all the way back to manuscript eras in the Middle Ages, now they have up through 1900 online. And so a friend of mine who has a PhD in, in uh, church history has gone, spent the last seven, eight years studying and, and doing searches Uh, in these bases, you know, that some academic people have uh, access to, and he's found a lot of these preacher of rapture statements. And so uh, the modern electronic field has allowed us to search and find a lot of these. In fact, another scholar who is a preterist post-millennialist, last I checked with him, uh, he has found seven or eight. In fact, Mm -hmm. he told Mark Hitchcock and I in an email that he has three file drawers full of pre-trib rapture statements that he's going to be unveiling over the years. And uh, so here you have a guy who doesn't even believe in this stuff and he is being honest enough to come up with uh, many people uh, down through church history have done this. And he's gone through the 500 volumes, you see, uh, that have never been translated into English. He's a Latin and Greek scholar. You have uh, uh, an interesting quotation here uh, uh, who, from a gentleman who lays out four criteria uh, for uh, believing in the pre-trib rapture. Yeah, this is a guy who was a Dallas grad back in the 50s, and he became anti-pre-trib, and a militant anti-pre-trib. And he did a Ph.D. dissertation at the University of uh, at New York University. And uh, he, he laid out four criteria for finding a preacher of rapture statement. And once again, this is back in the 50s before anybody uh, had found any of these uh, recent ones that we're talking about. And he says, number one, any mention that Christ's second coming was to consist of more than one phase separated by an interval of years. That's Mm -hmm. one criteria. Mm -hmm. Secondly, any mention that Christ was to remove the church from the earth before the tribulation period. Thirdly, any reference to the resurrection of the just as being in two stages. And, or fourthly, any indication that Israel and the church were to be clearly distinguished, thus providing some rationale for removal of Christians before God again deals with Israel. And so any one of these four criteria, he would say, would uh, be a historical basis. So I use that as my criteria uh, for finding preacher rapture statements by an opponent of uh, pre-tribulationalism. Hmm. Now, you mentioned Israel and a clear differentiation between the church and Israel, and I, and I think that's worth talking about for a moment. Yeah, that really didn't develop until the 1800s. Hmm. Because you have, even among uh, the brethren and some of these other people, like the Irvinites, they tended to see uh, uh, merge Israel and the church into a single plan and program. And people like Darby began to say, no, the church is a separate program. And they're not just the new Israel, you know, uh, the continuation. And so that, like I say, for 1800 years was hardly held by anybody. And so you you see these developments uh, arise in church history, and then people start seeing pre-tribulationalism uh, once they begin to realize that the church age is distinct from Israel. Well, you know, as a uh, believer in the pre-trib rapture, I get excited when I think of, of Israel returning back in the late 19th century, going through the 20th, the Holocaust, and in 1948 and following. I, it, those things excite me, but I find that a lot of modern churches are not at all excited about Israel. In fact, they, they rather take a rather negative view of Israel. Yeah, I've done a survey down through church history, and you don't begin to have people seeing 
the restoration of Israel till around the 1600s. Mm. And they were all Protestants, of course. Mm-hmm. Catholics believe that they were the end, that we're in the millennium. Right. Right now. And that the Catholic Church is it. And this is why you have, if you look on at Christmas on those masses that they have, you know, they got the 24 elders, the cardinals sitting there, and, and the, the uh, St. Peter's St. Cathedral, Peter's, uh, yeah, is arranged as if they were in the New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation, you see. So they think that we're in the millennium now. And that was adopted by most Protestants in the first generation. And then you begin to have the rise of Kiliasm or premillennialism in the late uh, 1500s. And the Puritans, especially in the 1600s, uh, especially in America, they virtually, you have one uh, of the early pr- uh, people that immigrated here said, we are all premillennialist. Hmm. And so you have premillennialism dominating in America and in England in the 1600s when they had a time of, of, of spiritual revival. Mm-hmm. And then the 1700s, it, you begin to have the rise of the Enlightenment. And it began to wipe out or that secular uh, emphasis. And then again in the early 1800s you, in Great Britain you had another revival of Christianity in which uh, over s- about 60% by the mid 1800s of the clergy in the Anglican Church alone became premillennial. And so you have the brethren and all of these people and you began to have the rise of premillennialism which then gives rise to uh, preacher of rapture. So if you're not even premillennial, so premillennialism was wiped out in church history around the 400s, even though the early church fathers were almost totally premillennial. And then for a, about 11, 1200 years, no one claimed to be premillennial. So hmm. if they're not premillennial, they're certainly not going to be pre-trib, you see. Right. And so uh, as a result, when premillennialism began to be restored, uh, then you began to have uh, the rise of pre-tribulationalism among a lot of these uh, writers. Now you have a section in uh, this article uh, entitled Imminency in the Early Church. Imminency meaning uh, that the Lord could return without any warning at any moment. And the thought would be that going back to the days of the early church fathers, uh, they wouldn't be thinking Christ would be coming back soon because several generations before them uh, people had hope for Christ's return and it didn't happen so right. they were sort of giving up. But the early church did have a doctrinal uh, connection with, yeah, the imi- in fact, with imminency. I cite scholars that point out about how the earliest early church uh, was expecting the Lord's return at any moment. And there are a number uh, of statements like in Irenaeus and some of the early, Irenaeus is a disciple of Polycarp who's a disciple of the Apostle John, you Mm -hmm. see. So he's two uh, generations away. And uh, they have statements that could be Mm pre-trib, but because of all the other stuff that they talk about, uh, they're probably not pre-trib. But they had uh, a belief that Christ could come at any moment, which is an element of pre-tribulationalism. Because if you believe in imminency, as we call it, that Christ could come at any moment, then you have to be pre-trib. Unless there's no uh, two-stage event, the rapture and then the second coming. And so uh, the, the idea that they believe Christ could come at any moment and take them to be with the Lord, uh, even though they didn't have all uh, the trappings that surround it, it's possible that even in the earliest church we, we see pre-tribulations reflected. But we never, I have never claimed any of these statements because of other context uh, that these particular writers give. But you see that imminency in one of these, a German scholar actually says by the 200s it's being wiped out. You know, they're settling down to live in this world, so to right. speak. And they're losing that 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 excitement that Christ could come at any moment. So they did believe in that pre-trib aspect that Christ could come at any moment, like we do, we believe today. And I've, I have my Bible open to 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5, and there is, of course, this wonderful description of... Uh, where Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. And then he talks about the uh, the rapture. <clears throat> and then immediately after that you come to chapter 5 
where, which opens, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. And he, he then begins to describe the tribulation. So he puts it all down. Yeah, in fact, uh, that's in the subjunctive mood. In other words, you are ignorant. Stop being ignorant. Yeah. Uh, in other words, you're going to stop being ignorant by understanding what I'm about to tell you. Is, okay. is, is the kind of the idea there. And then he talks about that. In fact, I think something important to point out here is uh, Paul, of course, was the apostle to the Gentiles. And Paul is not the only, but the primary revealer of what we call mysteries. Mm-hmm. And in the upper room discourse, right before, uh, less than 24 hours before Christ was taken away uh, and crucified, he gives a sermon which is only found in John's Gospel, chapters 13 through, uh, including the one in the Garden of Gethsemane, 17. And two thirds of the way through chapter 13, Judas leaves the room. Everything from that point on is brand new church age truth. Hmm. In other words, Everything relates to not looking back like in Matthew 24 that he'd given three or four days earlier, uh, but looking forward to revealing uh, the things that are going to be new called the mysteries in the epistles and stuff. And so Jesus introduces them to that. He's killed. And the first uh, uh, epistle that Paul writes is Galatians because of the controversy there at Mm -hmm. the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. But then the next two epistles that he writes are 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And right off the bat he introduces the doctrine of the rapture. And that's why 1 and 2 Thessalonians has more eschatology you know, per capita so to speak than any of the other epistles. And he introduces the rapture throughout 1 Thessalonians and continues to talk about the details of the tribulation and the rapture in 2 Thessalonians as well. And so that's I think important to understand that he's telling these people you are going to see your loved ones again. Uh, It may not be soon but it's going to happen because we'll all be united at the grand meeting in the sky you know at some point in the future. At some point. And to me the beautiful part of this is the timelessness of it. That is to say it applies to the church, the body of Christ, without reference to any particular time. And and getting your mind wrapped around this idea of the body of Christ across the ages from from the days of the apostles to this moment Mm -hmm. is what we're all about, I think. Yeah, and that's why... Uh, you can't time the rapture because it could happen at any moment and there are no signs preceding the rapture. And that's why in every passage that re- that speaks about this issue uh, related to the rapture never says we're, we're watching for signs. Those all relate to second coming passages. Instead the word waiting mm-hmm. is used. We're waiting for His Son from heaven. Even in Titus 2.13 where it says looking for the blessed hope and appearing that word translated looking there is the same Greek word for waiting. Hmm. It's better rendered I think waiting for the blessed hope and appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. And uh, so the believer there's nothing to look for because there are no signs that precede the rapture. And so you have these two sets of passages one of watching Mm -hmm. the signs like in the Olivet Discourse. Can you imagine if the rapture had happened and you're in the tribulation? I mean there are hundreds of events that have been prescribed to happen and the general sequence is there. So you're going to be able to, uh, you know, if you, let's say you're not saved today and, and the rapture happens soon and you become a believer after the rapture and you're going into the tribulation, you can mark, follow things in that way. But the church is always waiting and the, the motif is that of a bride who the, the son has gone back to the father's house and that's where we're going to be taken, yeah. to the father's house. Which uh, is not what happens if, it, if the rapture and the second coming are the same event where he comes back to planet earth and stays. So we're going to be taken to the father's house and then the bride has, is made ready and she returns. The marriage takes place in heaven but the marriage supper takes place in the millennium to celebrate uh, the new bride that Christ takes called the church. And 
it's laid out, I think, pretty clearly when you look at the details of the New Testament. And yet, in human nature, our, our tendency is, after a while, you know, we say, oh, well, it hasn't happened yet. And, uh, and then another generation passes, it hasn't happened yet. Right. And let's just go back to our uh, daily uh, work, and uh, because we don't want to burden ourselves with wondering when he's going to come. Yeah. You kind of drift away from that expectation. Yeah, and the antidote to that is is reading the Scripture, <laughs> reading the New Testament. Because yeah. pretty much about a dozen times it says that we should be waiting for his Son from heaven, that we're waiting for Christ. And so, yeah, if, if you get your focus off of what the Scriptures say, and just let's look at the practical implications of that. If Christ could come at any moment, and this is true historically, when people start believing in the preacher of rapture, they have a higher percentage of people that get involved in evangelism hmm. because they want their loved ones and those around them to be saved. There's a higher percentage of people involved in uh, missions and going on the mission field. And you know, that, that connection is clear when you think about the late 19th century uh, and, uh, and Darby and, and, uh, and Schofield and others. That coincided with great missionary movements. Yes, that's the 1800s, a late 1800s is, a, is considered the missionary time. And we were talking before the program about how people who believed in the rapture uh, were, many of them pioneered yeah. Went to areas where they got like Korea, yes. Where uh, a, a graduate from Princeton who was said to be a great scholar, and everybody said, "Oh, you need to be a professor and all of this." And no, he learned Korean because nobody had ever taken the gospel there, and that was his passion. And so he he translates books of the Bible into Korean, does all this work, and uh, the Koreans were considered the most fierce people in uh, that area of the world and that's why probably why they were never taken over by the Chinese. Mm. And so the the a boat takes them up to the mouth of a river and back then missionaries would take uh, their caskets with them because they never came back. Wow. And he had all of his belongings in that casket and they let him off, he's floating it to the shore and he's killed. A what, a, what a waste! <laughs> then a decade or two later the other missionaries come and guess what there are Christians in Korea that had fished his stuff out of the water read it and began to get saved and he'd given them the Bible even though he never was able to talk to one person and that's why I chuckled when you said what a waste Yeah, what God's uh, uh, methodology is beyond human uh, conception. And Korea, uh, at one point, I don't know if it still is, was the mo South Korea, the most Christian uh, percentage-wise populated country in the world. As uh, you come to the close uh, of your article in our magazine here, there's a little section called The Apocalypse of Elijah. Now, that's tantalizing. <laughs> <laughs> What does that have to do with this whole discussion, the apocalypse? Well, this is one of the earliest, uh, it's dated at 285, that taught a form of pre-tribulationism. And uh, I cite a citation from that and uh, about how uh, Christ would come at any moment and take believers, and then it talks about the tribulation taking place after that. And by the way, a lot of these people believe the tribulation was three and a half years because they're looking at the second half. And so even Darby up until uh, 15, 20 years later when he first started, he, he believed the uh, tribulation was three and a half years. But uh, as people studied it later, they realized it's a seven year interval. And so you see uh, the apocalypse of Elijah uh, is taught uh, a pre-trib rapture and the f it's interesting it's called the apocalypse of Elijah one of those who was taken to heaven, etc. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, 385 is pretty early. And how it says that they will be taken on their wings and removed from the wrath, the wrath being the tribulation. And uh, the term wrath, every use of it, refers to something that happens on planet Earth. In other words, it's not talking about going to hell. 
and, and this was written a long time ago, back in, uh, as you say, I think around 285. Yes. And, and, so, and it clearly mentions uh, being rescued from wrath. That's right. Even at that early date. Yeah, and you have uh, then pseudo Ephraim. Uh, they say pseudo because the scholars, you know, it was written around 385, you know, another preacher, a clear preacher of rapture statement. Uh, in fact, it says, we ought to understand thoroughly, therefore, my brethren, what is imminent or overhanging. See, that's that idea of imminent could happen at any moment. Why, therefore, do we not reject every care of earthly actions? Look at the logic here. And prepare ourselves for the meeting of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he may draw us from the confusion. The confusion would be from uh, the present circumstances and possibly even the tribulation period. Mm -hmm. He says, which overwhelms all the world. For all the saints and elect of God are gathered together before the tribulation. I mean, I mean, this was the first one that Grant Jeffrey found uh, 25 years ago, uh, which is to come and are taken to the Lord in order that they may not see any of the confusion that overwhelms the world because of our sins. And so uh, it's interesting uh, that, you, that when we started looking and had the means to look for these things, we do find people that taught the blessed hope even back then. Well, holding the magazine here, the September edition of the Prophecy Watcher, uh, I hope you get it because you'll be able to read uh, uh, Tommy Ice's uh, in, entire uh, article and kind of have time to think about the, the dates and the places and the names and the times and seasons. Uh, there's a lot of content there, and the content says this. Yes, there will be a catching away of the church, and yes, if you're a believer, you're going to be part of it. <laughs> <laughs> and don't let anybody talk you out of it. A lot of people are trying to talk us out of it today. Well, you know, I believe the rapture, preacher of rapture because of Scripture. But I deal with this issue because it's often brought up as a reason to not believe in the preacher of rapture. And today uh, we're offering uh, what we're calling the Mystery of the Rapture subscription package. One year subscription to the magazine plus this free bonus. A conversation that we had some time back called the Mystery of the Rapture. Uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Ice uh, took a long time to explain what he really believes and, and uh, we're putting these two items together, calling it the Mystery of the Rapture subscription package, one year subscription, free bonus, Studio 2 Mystery of the Rapture, yours for a gift of $30. And uh, the magazine subscription, of course, uh, month by month, is devoted to clarify subjects that have to do with Bible prophecy. And we go to the experts like Tommy Ice. And we really appreciate you for being here. Well, thank you. It's been great being here. I wish we had longer to talk because there, I, I have the feeling we've just started. And there's so much more to say. There's a lot more. Dr. Thomas Ice. Always a joy to talk with him. And uh, by the way, keep watching. We are... Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter. Or follow us at facebook.com slash prophecywatchers. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.